Good morning. It's good to see you all. Boy, it's a good thing to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Just being able to sing with everybody else in agreement, all of those things that we know and that we believe, boy, what encouragement that is. It is uh, for me anyway, because I don't get to do that except on Sunday. So, unless I uh, turn something on, but it's different when nobody else is here. I'm just by myself. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are able to be here. We're again in the book of Genesis in our pilgrimage through the book. We're coming very quickly to the end. We have uh, three whole chapters and we'll be done. And there'll be the end of Genesis. Don't ask me where we're going because uh, it's a secret. Probably Exodus, but I see. <laughs> It's a rebel in the front. You got to watch those people that sit in the front. They're close to your throat. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you lead us through all sorts of treacherous and difficult things only to create your character inside of us. We thank you for your word, which gives us clear direction and understanding as to who you are and what we can expect in your behavior towards us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who came not thinking of the cost to himself, but thinking of us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that dwells in each one of us who believes as a constant companion and guide that you remind us of everything that Jesus has spoken. Lord, I just pray that you guide each one of us today that we might put our hearts at rest before you like a ship into harbor, that we would allow you to just feed our souls, that you'd sharpen our minds, that you'd help us to have a greater capacity to love you and to love those around us. So, Lord, we're here. We pray that you do your work in each one of us. You know what we need, and you know we have great needs. And so, Lord, we come to the one who can fill that. That's you. So here we are, Lord. Guide us and help us as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in chapter 47 where Jacob is going to meet Pharaoh. Pharaoh has kind of been the uh, stand-in dad for Joseph while he's been away. If you remember, he was thrown in a pit, hated by his brothers, favored by his father, and yet they lied to dad and said, yeah, he's dead, but they sold him off as a slave. He gets his first job, and uh, he does exceptionally well, except there's a woman in the house who wants to do the dirty deed with him. And so he runs, and out of fear of God... And out of respect for the husband, he doesn't, and she frames him, and he goes to jail. And it just looks like one tragedy after the next. If you think you're having a bad day, read the book of Genesis and read about Joseph and everything. It just seems like he keeps doing well, and he gets brought down a peg, and he's doing excellent, and he's brought down a peg. And so he finally, in prison, he takes over. He basically runs everything because he's gifted by God in everything he does. And so God raises him up to take care of everything. He has a conversation with two guys that happen to have two dreams at the same, same night. He interprets them. One dies and one goes before Pharaoh to serve him and he forgets all about him. And so two years later, God sends a dream to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's all twisted up about it because it's rather horrific. And he goes, you know, I remember my fault this day. There was this guy. I know a guy. He's in prison, but he knows who God is and he knows what dreams mean. So they call Joseph out. They shave him up, clean him up, put him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him the dream. He immediately knows exactly what it is. And he tells him, and he goes, what you need to do is find yourself a good manager, somebody that can store away things, that can build projects, that can square away for the next seven years while things are good so that the next seven years of hardship will be okay. I hope you guys are saving for those seven difficult years. 
And he says, I don't know anybody else. I don't know anybody else who could do this job but you, Joseph. And he makes him number two in the kingdom. So he goes from being a nobody, from being a zero to being the hero. And of course, he's there to save his brothers. His brothers come to Egypt for food. After a series of events, he eventually re reveals himself to his brothers. And then he says, bring dad and bring him down. And so we looked at that last week. So as we look at the life of Joseph... Hopefully, you're going to see yourself. And he reveals himself to his brothers. And so Joseph says, listen, guys, it's okay. What you, what you did to me was not to hurt me. It's because God wanted me in this place. He wanted me to save you guys alive. And that's why I'm here. So I'm not holding you accountable. I'm blaming God. <laughs> but he was okay with it. Actually, every one of our complaints is really against God. Because if he's all powerful, which he is, and if he's sovereign, which he is, and he can do anything he wants, why would he let you go through anything difficult? Well, you don't get a sword, um, you know, by uh, wishing. <laughs> you have to melt steel and you have to beat it into formation. You have to grind it and heat it and cool it and heat it and cool it. And then you get a sword. Then you get something that's worth something. So it all depends on whether you want to be a sword or whether you want to be a pile of rocks, I guess. So... Joseph is finally ready to do this job. He's in position and he saves his family alive. Last week we saw them move to Egypt, which usually is not a good thing because the people of God going into a very worldly situation is never really a great thing. In fact, if you looked at the past and you look at his forefathers, it didn't work out well for them. And so it's a little nerve wracking. So last week we saw that he stopped home before leaving and he called out to God and he wanted to make sure that he was doing the right thing before stepping on Egyptian soil and stepping into trouble, he checks with God to make sure that this is okay. And he tells him, I'm going to be with you. I will give you peace. And I'm giving you a promise that you will find your son there and he is alive and he is the one who will close your eyes. In other words, when you die and close your eyes, he'll be there. And so he gave him the assurance that he'd make it there. And so after all of those promises, he decides to go. He and his entire household, and we talked about how God works in households. Amen? Amen. I hope some of you took that to heart because God works in households. The family is the basic uh, matrix by which God works. And it's the number one thing that Satan wants to destroy. Amen. You guys find that to be the case? There's nobody to give me a hard time like my wife or my kids. And the family is being attacked. Just the whole organization of the family is being attacked. And it is the number one way that God is going to work in your life to make you more like Christ, especially if you have a godly uh, spouse in your life. Uh, I know it's been helpful for me every once in a while. So... I, this is being facetious. If you're a guest here or you're watching online, it's just sarcasm. It's a love language in New Jersey. <laughs> How God works through households, we see even in the New Testament in Acts 11:14 with Cornelius and his household. We see the Philippian jailer gets saved. He and his entire household get saved. We see in 1 Peter 3, 1, even if you have a disobedient husband who does not obey the word, you wives without a word will win them over without a word when he observes your chaste conduct accompanied with fear or respect. And so we see that even if you're disobedient, even if you have an unsaved loved one, even if there are difficulties in your family and everybody's got their own mental illness, God works in households and he'll use you. In fact, maybe that's the reason you know him. And even if you have an unbeliever, which is very difficult to live with somebody who doesn't give a rip about what's right or wrong, but you did choose them and you made a covenant before God and a promise, and so you've got to stay there and you've got to make it work. And sometimes that's tough. Can I get an amen from married people? Okay. It's very tough sometimes. And yet, how do you know, oh husband, whether you will be the person who points them to Jesus Christ? How do you know, a wife, whether you will save your husband, that you will be the instrument that God uses to point their heart to Christ and people change? Although we tend to lose heart, don't we? We wonder if people ever really change, but they do. And then we read this incredible roll call of all of the people who went out, and there were 70 people. I won't read them again. 
And so as they move, we see that God brings a family out of Canaan. And then after, you know what happens in Egypt when they're taken captive. And it was predicted. God told them in advance what would happen. They come out of there uh, by, by conservative estimates, 2.1 million people leave slavery, go through the Red Sea, and they go into the Promised Land, and they go back. But it takes God 400 years to get things in place so that he can do that. And uh, hopefully we'll look at that. So we looked at the dispersion of Jews throughout the world, and uh, 51% of all the Jews in the world actually are in the Americas, in, in uh, USA. And 29% of all of those are actually in New York City. So chances are you know somebody. And we looked at the reunion when he finally comes and he puts his eyes on his father and the father on Joseph. And he says, it's true, although you, you don't look anything like the guy I met when he was 17 years old and, and he left my house. He's probably got makeup on. He's, you know, he's all dressed like, dressed like an Egyptian. And uh, so dad had to look real close to make sure it was him, not to mention his eyesight wasn't great. So he's, he's looking at him. He says, well, now I can die. And I can go much like Simeon did at the temple in the New Testament. And we see that they settled into a place called Goshen. Uh, Goshen is this uh, wonderful lush area. And Joseph tells him, listen, when Pharaoh talks to you, make sure that you tell him that you're a shepherd. Can you remember that, boys? Going into the interview, can you remember that you used that little keyword? Because it's really important. Joseph wants to make sure that they settle into the richest part of the land, but he also wants to make sure that they're far away from all the other things that go on in, in polite Egyptian society so that they're not going to get tainted by it. This week, we're in chapter 47, where we're going to finally look at Jacob who meets Pharaoh and the, that whole combination. Verse 1 and then Joseph went and told Pharaoh, he said, my father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. So I know what you're asking. Didn't he have more than five brothers? Hmm. I ask questions and sometimes I never get answers. But I do know that the number five in the scripture always refers to grace. It's a rather interesting concept, but all of the numbers in the scripture are used consistently throughout, and God uses them to communicate something. This, this is grace. It's interesting. He's presenting his brothers. Remember his brothers? The guys that wanted him dead? The guys that threw him in a pit? It's interesting. I bet Pharaoh doesn't know anything about it. And he presents his brothers before Pharaoh as though they've done nothing wrong. In complete forgiveness. Do you know that's what Jesus is going to do with you? Yes. You're going to stand before the Lord one day and it's as though you have never sinned. Because Jesus has taken it all upon himself on the cross of Calvary. I just thought I'd mention that. And so he presents his brothers and his father. In Jude one twenty four, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is able to present, Jesus Christ will present you before the Father, blameless, just like Joseph did before Pharaoh. That's kind of an exciting thought. In verse 3, And Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? That's the question. I knew he was going to ask. And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. And then they keep talking. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because our servants have no pasture for their flocks for the famine that is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Is that really the reason they came? You know, it's, it's important that when you say something that's important, you just say it and then don't try to follow up with a chaser of some kind because it just kind of muddies it, you know? You don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> this is when I do that. And so they're going to settle in the land of Goshen, which is right over here. This is this wonderful delta of the Nile, which is in uh, Egypt. 
and all of all of this area is wonderful for raising cattle and and all of that now these people are largely agrarian so they grow things but during a famine there's not much of that going on so the people that happen to have the animals are, are actually choosing the right thing to do and they go to a place where at least there's water from the Nile that is going to water that delta it's a very rich area everything seems to grow very well there and so they've got their eyes on the best the best possible place to settle away from all of the trouble and yet in a place where it's green and lush. You know, there's a place where Jesus is going to take you as well. You call it heaven. It's a lot like Goshen. It's a picture of that. And there, uh, then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph saying, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land and let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. So Pharaoh, seizing an opportunity to get some employees, says, thanks for coming. Any of you guys really good at this? And it's interesting because the question is never answered. He, I'm telling you, I read ahead. They, he, the question is never answered as to whether they're expert herdsmen, you know, if they know how to fix a sheep, if they know how to fix anything. So they're, they're silence speaks loudly. Anyway, so he says, you know, if any of you are really good, maybe you can serve in my livestock. And so now these guys, if they end up taking these jobs, they get paid. They get paid to do the thing they're going to do anyway. It's a little bit like Miriam went and found a, a, a maid to be able to feed a child and she got paid for it and little did the queen know it was actually the real mother. It's an interesting thing how God works. And then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And I think he said it like that. And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have, I have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. Isn't that interesting? So dad meets Pharaoh, the number one guy everywhere. And Jacob takes leadership and blesses Pharaoh. Isn't that interesting? You would think it would be the other way around. It, Jacob would be feeble and he doesn't see very well and he's 130 years old. That's old, right? That's a lot of years. And so he goes before him and he talks about this pilgrimage. It, the way he talks about his life, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. It's interesting how Peter writes in, in 1 Peter 2.11 that, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. A pilgrim is somebody that's going from here to there and they know that they have a purpose and they have a beginning and they have an ending point. It's like us. And you're not settled down. It's like if you go on vacation. If you go on vacation or if you go to the beach, you don't live there. You're just visiting. You're just passing through. That's what a pilgrimage is. And it's interesting, at 130 years old, he knew that he wasn't sticking around. I'm on my way somewhere else. He's looking forward to something else. And I just think that that's a, a really good way to look at our lives. So he then comes up and blesses Pharaoh. So he probably touches him, probably on the head and probably blesses him in the name of God. And so here he is just being an evangelist, which I think is fantastic. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And we know in Hebrews 7, 7 straightens it out for us. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. We find that out with Melchizedek and Abraham, if you remember when they met on the, on the, the field of Shinar. Okay, I went too far. And so he realizes he's a pilgrim and he's on his way somewhere else. And it's interesting how he compares himself with his fathers. He compared himself with his fathers. 
It's interesting. How do you how do you get away from doing that? Like if your if your dad was somebody, you're always kind of living in his shadow. Or if you had an older brother, you know, why couldn't you be like your older brother? You know, you tend to live in the shadow of all that, and it seems like he's comparing it. We shouldn't do that, should we? But I think what he's saying is, I didn't get to reach the ripe old age just yet of my father or his father. You know how old his father was when he died? 175. I'll just give it to you because it's not a game show. And you know how old his father was when he died? It's 180. So we're talking about some two older folks. And he says, I'm only 130. I haven't reached, I haven't reached that stage yet. Um, at least not yet. And so Jacob says, few and evil have been the days. That's a heck of a way to look at your life, isn't it? Few and evil. In other words, time goes like that. I remember my kids when they were first born. I remember lots of kids that are adults now. I don't know about you, but you, you see things going like this? My goodness, time just absolutely flies. And so when he says that he's had few days, I think that's what he means. It seems like a, it seems like a vapor that's here and then it's gone. As James says in chapter 4, verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And he talks about how the days have been evil. He doesn't mean that he's been doing evil. He just means that it's been a difficult life to live. It's been, there's been a lot of hardship and difficulty. My boys went off and killed an entire town full of men. Um, you know, he's got, he's got some stories to tell and you guys know them. So he's talking about how quick his life went and how it was full of what he sees as tragedy. But we know that he's kind of a tragic character anyway, right? Yeah. But he's been through some things. I had to run away from my brother. He chased me down. I ended up bargaining to get married. Now I have four wives. You know, so he's got some stories to tell about how difficult his life has been. But he doesn't get into all that with Pharaoh. It just says that his days have been few and evil. And he hasn't raised up to the level of his forefathers just yet. At least, not yet. It reminds me of that, that clip from Gladiator. That, that one guy that says, not yet. But he's heading that way. In verse 11, And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses. By the way, it wasn't called Ramesses just yet because Ramesses wasn't alive yet. But as Moses is writing this, he's putting a contemporary word in there in case you're wondering about that. As Pharaoh had commanded. And then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread according to the number of their families. Now there was no bread in the land. For the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished before the famine. It's interesting, a lot of talk about bread, that they were supplied bread when there was no bread. They were in the best of the land when nobody had any good land at all, and they were very well provided for. Do you know how much God has blessed you? You know how fortunate it is that we live in this country, as broken as it is? We still have it a whole lot better off than if you were in Afghanistan, you get your head cut off. God forbid you, you uh, back up and, and a, a Koran falls off the table onto the ground, they'll cut your head off. I mean, there are some crazy things. There are women who get abducted off the street because they don't have their face covered. They're the morality police. And you'll get tortured for that. It's just, an, it's an amazing thing. God has placed the lines of our boundaries in very nice places. How many of you eat? The rest of you are sleeping. Okay. Yeah, you might eat more than once. How many of you eat more than once in a day? Okay, yeah, that explains a lot for me. So he gives them... All of this wonderful stuff, he gives them possessions, he gives them a portion, he gives them a place, and God is taking care of them through Joseph. Isn't it amazing that that's what Jesus does for us? Amen. He takes care of our needs, and I'm grateful for that. So you can imagine Jacob in his cart heading back because, you know, they didn't carry him. 
He's in a cart, and he's going, you know, things are pretty good. I think we're doing all right. David writes in Psalm 16, 5 to 7, Oh, Lord, you are my, the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. So not only do we have all these things because God has gifted us with that, but we have the more important thing, which is God's presence. If you're ever around somebody that has a lot of the world's wealth, but has absolutely no relationship with God, you know what a fortunate thing it is that you just said, I'm a bum and I need God in my life. What a fortunate thing you did. What a decision, a covenant you made to God that you break all the time, but God won't break his when he makes it to you. What a wonderful thing. I was just talking to somebody about going, going to a place with a bunch of worldly people and all the bananas and crazy things that were going on and, and then coming into church where you don't have to deal with all that. It's not like there's nothing to deal with, but you don't have to deal with all of that. And what a, what a pleasant thing it is to have God draw the lines in your places. And he takes care of us. In verse 14, and Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain in which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So Joseph was going to work. He's still, they're still in a famine and he's still getting money from the people and giving out grain. He has enough for everybody. In fact, there are other nations, including Israel, who come and they're feeding them. But they don't just give it away. They're, they're exchanging it for money. And so he's taking all of the money and little by little, you can see all of the money getting drained out of the country and it's all in Pharaoh's hands. And you say, that doesn't seem fair. Well, I guess you have a choice. You could die or try to grow something without water. But these folks were forced to do so. And I don't think this is a, a stamp of approval by God on socialism, but this is what happened. And you have to wonder, well, why does God put this stuff down? First Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil of which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, money can be a huge temptation because if you have all that you ever wanted, you have no challenge and you certainly have no needs, right? I don't have to cry out to God for anything. I don't ever have to get emotional. <laughs> I don't ever have to reach out to anybody else for help. My goodness, I hate doing that. Don't you? I find it so hard to ask other people for help. I shouldn't need help. I should do it myself. But sometimes I can't. And what a blessing it is when people ask you for help, when they need help. Isn't it a blessing to help? Well, you should let people give, right? So money can be a big temptation. Second Corinthians 9, 7, another principle. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. These folks were making an exchange money for grain, but what God really wants is for us to give with cheer. He doesn't want to say, oh, I'm going to write that stinking tide check to GBF and see you know, he doesn't want that under obligation. If, if that's the sense that you're giving, God doesn't want you to do it. He wants you to do it with a free heart, out of thanksgiving for what he's done for us, out of, you know, this is the bare minimum of what I can return to, to help the Lord with his kingdom. So that's a principle of giving, which I think is hugely important. It's not of necessity. It's not an obligation. It's not something that you have to do. It's something you get to do. And that's the way it should be. It's like, my wife says, good morning, and I get to go kiss her. It's not like I have to, I got to kiss my wife. Before I leave the house, I always kiss my wife. Before she goes anywhere, before I go anywhere, I always kiss my wife. Because it could be the last one. And so if I don't value her while I have her, then what's going to happen when I don't? I'll be really sorry I didn't when I didn't. So let each one give as his purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. One more principle, Luke 6:38. Jesus states this, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom or into your lap. 
For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. All of those terms are actually used for grain. If a woman were to go buy grain, she would take, take up her dress, the folds of her dress, and they would pour it in because they didn't have, you know, nice little disposable bags. So you had to carry it with something that you brought. And it Steve? Oh. Suddenly the sound went. I had no voice. All of those terms are used about grain, which is interesting because these folks are buying grain and the grain's getting poured into their laps and they're walking away with enough food to be able to eat. And it's interesting that if you're willing to give and if you're good about giving, God will continually give to you so that you can keep giving. Amen. It's when you hold on to it and you hoard it, <laughs> God's not going to continue to bless you beyond a certain point. And he might say, hey, you fool, your, your, your soul is required of you this night. In John 6, 32, and Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger and he who believes in me shall not thirst. Do you believe that? Amen, I believe that thoroughly because he's the one who provides for our deepest needs. Just like these folks are going before Joseph to get their needs met, Jesus is the true bread of life in which all these other things might picture. Isaiah 55, 1 encourages us, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you, will and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's the invitation that God gives to us on a spiritual level to come to feed on him because that's really going to be the purpose of our life, not eating and drinking and clothes and jobs. It's about having a right relationship with God. And it's just this open invitation to come and feed. And verse 15, so when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us bread. For why should we die in your presence? That just sounds like such a, like a, like a Yiddish mother would say. Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. And then Joseph said, give your livestock and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. And so they brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle, the herds, and the donkeys. Thus, he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. So one year they come and they say, listen, we need food. And he goes, okay, you guys have money, right? Dig it up from wherever you planted it in your garden and bring it here and, and you'll have food. They finally run out of money and they say, that's it. The money has failed because money always fails. Amen. And money talks. It always says, bye. <laughs> so... He says, your, your money's gone. Well, you, you still have assets, guys. You still have stuff. So bring me the stuff. Bring me your animals. And, and we'll be able to bargain that way and you'll get fed. And that's one sure way of not becoming a slave is to make sure that you can pay your own bills and you're not beholden to anybody. Well, so they give up all their animals. And, and who's taking care of those animals? The people of Israel are. And so it's, it's not a bad deal. They're, they're there by God's <laughs> sovereign choice, and they're able to, to make good on this. In Matthew 16, 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, Jesus said. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in his glory of his Father with his angels, and then... He will reward each according to his works. You see, these folks were at a point where they had to realize we're going to starve unless we do something. So we're going to give away all our stuff. You know, the Lord's asked you to do the same. Because you don't come to Jesus and say, yeah, I, I, I think I would like to ask Jesus into my life just as an ingredient, like you'd put an ingredient in soup. It's not an ingredient. He wants everything of our lives. He wants all your stuff. He wants all of your thoughts. He wants all of your passions. He wants all of your plans. 
God wants to take control of all of that because it's only in doing that that he's going to be able to do what he really wants to do. It's when we substitute other things in place where he should be where things get messed up in our own lives. Luke 14, says, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. He thought I was just making it up here on stage, right? That's what the scripture says. We have to give everything to him because when the Lord says, listen, I, I, I died for you, I came and bled for you so that I might take on your sins so that you might have my righteousness, the exchange is we give everything because he gave everything for us, amen? And that's the hard thing, isn't it? And yet God is the one who gives us strength to be able to do it. Verse 18, now when that year had ended, they came to him next year and said to him, we will not hide from our Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds and livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and, your, and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die that the land may not be desolate. Well, that's pretty bad. They have to give up the property ownerships of the things that they have and their own lives as slaves now to Pharaoh. And I don't normally say that that's a good thing to do, but that's the way the kingdom of heaven is. The best form of government is not democracy. It's a theocracy where God's in charge because he is the most beneficent dictator that you'll ever find. Amen? Amen. Boy, I'm stirring the pot today, political. <laughs> and so they give up their land. You know, we have to give up our stuff too because it's not really our stuff. It's just kind of on loan. And we're going to have to stand and give an account before God as to how we did with the things he gave us. And you don't want to go burying it. You don't want to take the talent, the, the, the sum of money, the life that you have, the abilities the sharpness of your mind, the softness of your heart, whatever it is that you have, you don't want to bury that and forget about it because you'll have to stand before the Lord and he says, hey, what'd you do with that thing I gave you? Uh, what thing? And then you're going to discover there's a whole bunch of things that he gave you to do. And I don't want to come up short. I want to make sure I use all of them for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. It includes my stuff, my land, my house, my anything, my life. I want to make sure that I glorify him with it. Matthew 10, 36 to 39 says this. And a man's enemies will be of those of his own household. That's great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I probably shouldn't have put that in there because it's a continuation of the thought before. Forgive me. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household, Jesus said. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. Or if you want to try to hold on to your life, you'll lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus teaches us the cost of discipleship is everything. He really wants all of our lives. It's not like, well, I'll just have an ingredient. Jesus will just be an ingredient in my life. No, he's, he's the king and prince of all of heaven. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. And the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. Isn't that interesting? So these priests, now by the way, these aren't godly priests. These are priests in Egypt. Like the priest of On, which was his father-in-law, if you remember. He was one of those priests. And they're serving all sorts of crazy Anubis and all these crazy gods. But Pharaoh made sure that they had their lot and they didn't have to pay. And they were taken care of just like the people of Israel. Don't you find that interesting? 
I find it more interesting, I, I suppose. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace in which he made to abound toward us with all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. You see, in the New Testament, Christ is gathering all unto himself in the spiritual sense. Pharaoh, who is the king in our story, is gathering everything because of Joseph. Joseph is the one who is bringing them all to Pharaoh. And doesn't Jesus do that for us? Isn't it his desire that all become saved, that all are saved and escape, you know, the wrath to come? Absolutely. And so the Old Testament here is a picture of what Jesus does in the spiritual for us. Amen? Amen. Okay. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You see, God really wants our heart more than he wants our stuff. He really wants us. And that's ultimately the end of what the Lord wants is everything that we have, everything that we do, all that we say, everyone we meet, but he wants us and he wants our heart. He wants us not to be willful, not to be fleshly. He wants us to just be given over to him so that he might move into our lives and bless us in the ways that he likes to. So, you also have these pagan priest problem. You got these priests who are, seem to be taken care of over here, uh, much like the people of God are over here. I don't know, have you ever asked the question, you know, why doesn't God just come and straighten all this out? Take this one out and that one out and this one, level, the, make, level it, start all over again. Why doesn't he do now? Because there's an allotment for a period of time, isn't there? For the evil one who is our enemy. There's an allotment given to him just for a little while. And there's a time when the false prophet and the beast and ultimately Satan, the great dragon, will be thrown into the pit of fire. And there is a deadline. There is a deadline when that's going to happen. But it's not yet. And just like here, in the dev devastating difficulties, God's taking care of the people of Israel. And yet, you also see that there's evil that still lurks and still is there. But it's there for a period of time only. So I just thought I'd straighten that out because I was wondering about that myself. <laughs> then Joseph said to the people, indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you. So now he's giving them seed instead of them having to provide it. And you shall sow the land and it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one fifth to Pharaoh. Four fifths shall be your own as seed for your fields and for your food and those of your household, and as food for your little ones. And so they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord that we will be Pharaoh's servants. Never heard anybody beg to be a slave before. <laughs> and Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests only, which did not become, that did not did not become pharaohs. So they were exempt, these guys, on the outside. You know what one-fifth is? It's 20%. How many of you would like to pay 20% tax only? Because I think, I think it's somewhere near the end of June that you finally pay off all of your taxes cumulatively and you actually begin working for yourself. You take sales tax, you know, income tax, all the taxes that we pay. It's a whole lot more than one-fifth, isn't it? I, I think we should go to this plan, don't you? It's biblical. <laughs> so you see, Joseph is making this a law, and he's making it very gracious for these people. And not only that, he's providing them seeds so they can get started in their land. It's a, it's a really great problem um, that he's solving, which is very beneficent. In Luke 19, verse 8 to 10, it reminds me of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? Uh, any, any of you from Sunday school are singing the song in your head right now? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. 
I always want to say that with an Irish accent, but I won't. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was a very well-known IRS agent who used to line his pockets with other people's money. And because of his affiliation with the Romans, he made himself an enemy of his own people, the Jews. Zacchaeus one day climbed a tree because he wanted to just see Jesus and Jesus invited himself and all his disciples over for lunch. <laughs> and he climbed down quickly and he prepared. And in the midst of that confrontation, Zacchaeus' heart melts. And it's reflected in what he gives. He says, I'm going to give away half of everything I own to the poor who need it. And if I've ripped anybody off, I'm going to restore fourfold. By the way, the law says you're supposed to retu- return twice. If you've stolen, you return it twice over. So if you stole 100 bucks, you return 200 That's a pretty good investment. But he says, I'm going to do it by four. When there's a right heart, there's always a response, and it's always coupled to your giving. If, if you want to know how thankful you are, take a look at your life and see what you give and how you give. And how, how much are you willing to suffer for another person? That's really the gauge. Anyway, it reminds me of the widow who put in two mites into the offering plate. And by the way, if you don't know what a mite looks like, it's, it's not like a little animal. It's a, a, the <laughs> smallest piece of money. I know Jules has one. It's the smallest piece of money that you can have. You can barely see it in those hands that I have up there. And this widow went in and put these two little things, didn't even make a sound in the big brass jar, you know, just ding, ding, where there are people that go and, you know, they're dumping out change, you know, and of course, you know, the, the, the money that doesn't make any sound, you know, in paper. Those folks were giving and giving and giving, and there was this widow who went up and she just gave these two mites, and he said, that woman right there gave more than everybody else. And the disciples are like, what? Because she gave out of her necessity, not out of her luxury. She gave out of her necessity. It hurt her to do that. When it hurts you to give, boy, that's, that's something, isn't it? That's a, that's a sign that we really love the Lord and we love other people. And so I, I think about how Joseph was taking care of all of these folks. And, um, and they were so grateful. They say, you know, you saved our lives. So we're, we're eager to just do whatever. And Joseph treated them exceptionally well. And what he did is he gathered all of this stuff up for Pharaoh, which when I heard, I was like, that stinks. That's like making your boss rich while you go poor. Any of you have a problem with that? It's like paying rent. I'm paying somebody else's bills. What am I doing? And yet with Joseph... Joseph was doing this to bring it to the king. You know, Jesus wants us to bring everything to the king. Everything. Every piece of what we have. I just have to remember how to work this. Oh, yeah, we still have the priests. The priests still have this in this great economy. The priests are still exempt. And so Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions there, and they grew, and they multiplied exceedingly, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. That's a good age. And the time grew near when Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. And then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. And so Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. It's interesting. He knew he was going. He knew it. 
and this isn't the first person I've read about or known even personally who knew the end was coming. Yep. A godly person will know that. Yep. Of course, dying of freak accident on the highway, there's no knowing of that. But he knew it was coming. He was 147 years. It's interesting. How many years was he in Egypt? 17. 17. How old was Joseph when he was taken out of his care? Hmm. You think there's a reason? I think the Lord gave him back what, anyway. So, so how many of you will be going home at some point? I hope so. I hope so. I hope, I hope heaven is your home. My question is, do you have an appointment? That's what he, do you have an appointment? That's what he said to Tom Hanks. And I was, just in case the video didn't work, I have it written out for you. There. Do you have an appointment? You know, there's a place called Goshen, actually in Egypt, but there's a place called Heaven where the Lord has for us. And it's the best of everything. And the only way you're going to get there is not by being good enough. It's about completely throwing yourself at the mercy of God and saying, Lord, I need you in my life. Jesus came from heaven. The eternal God became man, lived a perfect human life. And so like Joseph, he was Egyptian and Israeli. Jesus took on the form of a man and humbled himself even to death on a cross. And he did that so you and I would have a place in heaven to be able to go to. Not only that, but that he would save us from ourselves because boy, we need a lot of saving, don't we? That's why Jesus came. Do you have an appointment? I hope you do. So next week, we're going to look at Jacob saying goodbye. He's going to call his sons one at a time, and he's going to bless them. And what you don't know yet is he's going to prophesy on each one of them. And the prophecies are absolutely remarkable in how they come to pass in the future. And us looking back can see that. And so we'll look at that next week. Mm -hmm.